Charles Plosser, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and I just want to welcome all of you here this morning. We're delighted, we're delighted to have you. Um, the Global Independence Center and the Philadelphia Fed have been partners in a number of things over the last 30 years. We have been deeply engaged with GIC's agendas, with their programs, and we believe they do important and very good work. Uh, we have lots of shared interests around the world. And as a consequence, a GIC has been able to bring together policymakers, experts, uh, and the business community uh, on a wide range of international economic topics that are important around the world. And then be able to create a dialogue between, between those groups. And I found them very, very useful, enjoyable, and, and valuable in many, in many dimensions. Um, and so we've been in partnership with them in, on, on lots of efforts. So in that sense, we're delighted to have you here for the first inaugural conference on women and risk. Um, the GIC's programs around the world, both um, all over the world actually, have found it very valuable to have the Federal Reserve participants engaged. They get engaged with other, foreign, other central banks uh, and communities around the world. And I've always found those experiences quite valuable, as I said earlier. Um, I participated in a number of them, both here in the United States and in other parts of the world. And uh, one of your keynote speakers this morning, Sandy Pianalto, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, has done the same thing. I think we keep coming back to participating in these programs because we find them interesting and valuable, and we learn something when we do that. So I want to thank GIC for its efforts. Uh, and uh, uh, congratulate them on this, inaug this inaugural conference. As I said, Sandy is um, your keynote speaker this morning. I'm not really going to introduce her, but I am going to say that I sit next to her, right next to her. She's slightly to my left, I think. I, she sits on my left. Uh, you, you can take that for whatever you, however you'd like to describe it. In any event, though, but we, we sit next to each other uh, at FOMC meetings every six weeks. And so we've gotten to be good friends and very knowledgeable, and we, we share a lot, of, a lot of different ideas, and I have a lot of respect for her, and I've learned a lot from her. She's been in the system for many, many years and um, has played many different roles in the Federal Reserve System. So she's not only a knowledgeable executive, but she's a knowledgeable policymaker as well. Uh, so I think this is going to be a very interesting day. You also, of course, have Sheila Baer speaking this afternoon, former chairwoman of the uh, FDIC. Uh, but I'd like to make one more little plug here, if I could. Um, December 23rd of 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was, was founded, signed by Woodrow Wilson. So we are coming up on our 100th anniversary as a central bank. It's pretty much an accomplishment for us. Uh, and, and, but it's a time to reflect and think about our past and think about our future as well. And so. When you think about this conference, Women in Risk, you might find it appropriate or interesting to walk out back into the auditor at, out to the uh, courtyard out there and look at the pictures on the windows. Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, like every other reserve bank, opened its doors in November of 1914. So we're just shy of 100 years of our official opening. Those pictures on the wall are what we call windows into our past. And they're pictures of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, its employees, its activities that have occurred over the last 100 years. And one of the things you might contemplate a little bit is to look at the workforce, look at the pictures, look at the people who have contributed to the Federal Reserve System over the last 100 years. I think you'll see that the workforce has changed and it's evolved. And it's a very different looking workforce today than it was 100 years ago. <clears throat> Women in particular have risen to the highest ranks <clears throat> in the Federal Reserve System. Not only do we have Sandy, who's uh, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, Esther George is the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, and presumably in a few weeks, Janet Yellen will be uh, uh, selected and nominated, she's already been nominated, uh, chosen as the new chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. First woman ever to make it to that position. Uh, 
Um, and so it's an exciting time for the Federal Reserve. I think it's an exciting time for women in the workplace and the opportunities that are there and also the challenges that they face. But it is an exciting time, and so I think this conference is an appropriate uh, time to explore those ideas, seize the opportunities. And so I want to thank the GIC for doing this, and we're delighted to have you as guests here at the Philadelphia Federal Reserve. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Plosser. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Caracoli. I'm a GIC board member and uh, conference chair. This is our inaugural conference for women. It is about women, but not necessarily for women, not exclusively. We see some men in the crowd, and I want to thank them for being here, because this is about looking at women as an underserved market in a lot of ways, how we're analyzed, how we're served for financial products, the education we're offered, the opportunities that we seek to help our financial standing in the world, to help our colleagues improve their financial standing in the world, to help our businesses that we run have a better place financially. So it is about getting ideas to tap into the female market for those of you who want to improve your relationships with your, your female clients. It's a way for you to gain knowledge about how to run a business that includes a very important part of the workforce, and that's women. And also, how to get access to things like funding. How do you fund your projects? How do you do it internally? How do you do it externally? So there's a lot we want to look at today. We have just a plethora of amazing speakers uh, from our, our keynotes, uh, President Pianalto, uh, Sheila Bear, and our panelists, just a great uh, array of speakers that we'll be uh, presenting for you today. And I think it, this is a time for you to get out your notebooks, get the pen ready, because I think you're going to get a lot of terrific ideas. And also I want to let you know, while we may not want cell phones ringing, I totally appreciate having a cell phone out and live tweeting if you want to talk about this event, or hashtag. Hashtag GICWC in the corner there. So feel free. We welcome it, love it, and it's just about getting the word out. We came up with this idea to have this conference about a year ago. As a group of us met after one of our GIC board meetings and said, we really want to look at how we can bring more women into the fold at GIC, but also really look at this idea of women and risk. Is it true? Are women more risk averse? And if they are, and that's an if, is that a market opportunity? So from that conversation at dinner a year ago, we are here today. So I want to thank you all for being part of this inaugural event. And I also want to thank SAP, uh, our chief sponsor for this event, Debbie Schmidt, uh, got on board with this idea of how important having a conference like this. Not a women's leadership conference, which we all have attended and they're fantastic, but something a little more substantive. And Debbie's support early on and SAP's support early on really allowed this to happen. So I, I'm very grateful for that. And as we uh, get ready to launch today's program, I'd like uh, to bring up the chair of the Global Interdependence Center, George Tachekos my friend and uh, our long-serving uh, board member who became a chair a year ago, George. Thank you very much, I appreciate it, and I want to welcome you all to this important inaugural conference for women, but at the same time I want to uh, extend my gratitude and appreciation to SAP for their sponsorship, but also the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, our host institution, I would say, here, and uh, Charles Ploser has been a great supporter to us. Uh, GIC, as you perhaps know, this is my official plaque, uh, focuses on expanding the global dialogue to improve cooperation among citizens and countries. Uh, we organize conferences, of course, and uh, we have been around the globe uh, uh, so many times, and we are very proud of uh, the engagement that we have with the community, the academics, uh, but also the business community and the policymakers. 
Uh, one new theme uh, here at GIC is a scholarship program that we offer to students, and I'm very pleased to uh, mention to you, based on the support of Cumberland Advisors, today we host Tanya Moore, student from New College in Florida. Uh, Tanya, thank you very much for joining us, another woman. And uh, we plan to expand this program as well as we give uh, the opportunity to uh, young women, men and women, to join our organization and be exposed to many uh, wonderful ideas and themes that we present. Uh, I want also to introduce right away uh, the chair of the first panel, uh, Catherine Mann. Uh, Catherine is a fellow board member. Uh, is the Richard, uh, it's a Rosenberg chair in global finance uh, at the uh, International Business School, Brandeis University, and is a visiting uh, scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston. Uh, she was previously the fellow at the Pedersen Institute for International Economics in Washington, and her work really covers a lot of international themes and topics uh, of finance and economics. Uh, she has been, uh, she's a graduate of MIT, and she has, she's widely published. Uh, I, I would like to ask her to join me here uh, after Mary makes some remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brandeis yes. students, my apologies, uh, <laughs> Catherine. We want to welcome as well the Brandeis student that uh, received scholarships as well that is here with us today. Thank you. Well, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Sandy Pianalto. Uh, you know, I've been to Cleveland several times, actually. Um, I'm an East Coaster, and uh, usually I fly over, you know, the Midwest and, and don't stop. But um, whenever I've had the opportunity to go to Cleveland and to visit the Federal Reserve uh, branch there, um, Sandy has been uh, tremendously welcoming. Um, she also has an incredibly long history with the Federal Reserve System. Um, I think this is as a testimony to um, how welcoming the Federal Reserve is to, to women in their ranks. Uh, women economists in the Federal Reserve are, are almost 50 percent of the, um, the economist staff. I, I can't really speak to the other parts of the, the, the banks because I've always worked with the economists. But that is in um, significant contrast to what we see in both business and in academics. So when we think about the leading role that the Federal Reserve can play in this uh, topic of women in the financial community, uh, the Federal Reserve has played a very important role. Uh, Sandy has been at the head of the Cleveland Fed, um, and you were, I think, perhaps the first woman bank president, is that, is that correct? Okay, so one of the first, one of the earliest um, members of the, uh, the women members of the FOMC, uh, because of course the Federal Reserve Bank presidents um, rotate uh, on their roles as um, policy makers within the FOMC. Of course they all go to the FOMC meetings, not everybody gets to vote. But so uh, Sandy has been one of the few uh, women voices on the FOMC for a long period of time. And so I think that says something about how the, the, this part of the financial community, the Federal Reserve, uh, has played a leading role for and leading voice for women in the um, financial market. So please uh, welcome Sandy Pianalto. Thank you, Catherine, for that um, introduction. 
And, um, and I also want to thank uh, David and Mary for inviting me to uh, join you at this inaugural event. Uh, and this is the fourth time that I've um, spoken to uh, a global inter interdependence uh, conference. And so I'm very familiar with the work uh, of GIC, and I share uh, Charles Prosser's comments about the um, important, important work. Uh, but um, the speeches that I've delivered at GIC conferences in the past were focused on the economy and monetary policy. And today, though, GIC has turned its focus to women's issues, which I believe uh, deserves our attention, and that's why I agreed uh, to participate today. You know, many women just don't realize the critical role that we play in the economy and, um, and as a group, the great potential that we have. So I commend GIC for um, spotlighting these issues, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to present some of my thoughts on this issue. And I'm also very pleased uh, with the timing of this event. Uh, it's the day before Janet Yellen will be uh, having her hearings at the Senate Banking Committee. She, she will be um, uh, in the spotlight tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, you know, Vice Chair uh, Yellen has just been a tremendous uh, uh, leader in the Federal Reserve System. She's had a great career in the Federal Reserve System. And uh, I am, her, she's demonstrated strong leadership and I, would very much like to see a capable woman like uh, Janet uh, chairing the Federal Reserve. So I think this is, it's a historic period for, for women in the Fed. And as Catherine said, you know, the Federal Reserve has been uh, welcoming uh, to women. And so I'm, I'm so very excited that uh, Janet Yellen will be uh, the first woman to chair the Federal Reserve's um, board and uh, chair of the FOMC. So this is an historic uh, period for us. Now, the Federal Reserve Bank presidents uh, get a lot of attention, um, but our attention is, is usually focused on the role that we play at the FOMC in setting monetary policy. So we get a lot of attention in that role. Um, right today, uh, these days, everybody's interested in our views on uh, tapering, uh, when we're gonna taper and, and, and how. But as Federal Reserve Bank presidents, we are also responsible for running very large organizations. And I've been the CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland for the past 10 years. And in that role, I spend a lot of time focused on making sure that we have a diverse and inclusive workplace. I spend a lot of time focused on creating, working with my team to create an environment where every employee, and we have about 1,000 employees at the Cleveland Federal Reserve Bank, uh, where all 1,000 individuals uh, can contribute their maximum uh, potential. So, the, uh, and as um, uh, Charles pointed out, that the Federal Reserve looks very different today than it did 100 years ago uh, when we were created. Well, I started at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland in 1983. Uh, that's not quite 100 years ago, but a long time ago. And the bank looks very different uh, today than when I started. Now, um, when Catherine said, uh, when Catherine was commenting on my being the first woman, uh, I mentioned that I was going to say something about that. I was not, I'm not the first woman to run the Federal Reserve, uh, Federal Reserve Bank. I'm the third. But the very first woman uh, to run the Federal, uh, Federal Reserve Bank was Karen Horn, who was at the Cleveland Fed when I joined the Cleveland Fed in 1983. So, um, but as I said, the bank looked very different uh, then than it does today. Even though Karen, a woman, was leading the bank, there were no women in senior officer positions back in 1983. Today, one third of my senior management team are women. So we have made some progress, but you know, diversity and inclusion is a journey, and it's never complete. Uh, we, we continue to, to stay focused on it. But today, I'm going to describe some of the ways that women contribute to the U.S. and the global economy, and uh, also talk about uh, how some of those contributions can get cut short. Um, and I'll also share some lessons that I've learned that I hope um, can help women take control of their own careers. 
So let me start by citing a few statistics that illustrate women's impact on the global economy. Uh, and you'll note with each set of these statistics that I, I will be um, describing, there's a good news component and a bad news component. Women make up approximately one half of the population, both domestically and globally. Women perform 66% of the world's work and women produce 50% of the world's food. Yet women earn only 10% of the world's income and own less than 2% of the world's property. Here in the US, the women's labor force participation rate has increased from 41% in 1970 to almost 58% today. Over that period, there was a mass entry of women into the labor force, and women added 25% of the country's economic output. And yet, today, women earn only 78 cents for every dollar that men earn for the same work. Even those women who are initially paid the same as their male counterparts when they are hired, they tend to fall behind by about 5% after just two years. The numbers are even more concerning when you look at what happens once women spend time in the workforce. Statistics have found that women are being left behind at every rung of the ladder to advancement. Women make up about half of the U.S. labor force, but only 14% make it to a, an executive office and only 8% are among the top earners, and only 4% um, of our Fortune 500 companies are led by women. And the story, but the story is just the opposite when you look at where, um, at, at the household, where women are still very much the true leaders. A Pew Research study from earlier this year shows that the total family income is higher when the mother, not the father, is the primary breadwinner. When it comes to consumer spending, it's women, not men, who dominate. Uh, women pump about $28 trillion into the global economy every year. Research also shows that women invest 90% of their income back into the household, compared to about 35% by men. In households where the income is controlled by women, families tend to have better health, better nutrition, and better education because less money is spent on pursuits outside of the home when women are the breadwinners. In layman's terms, it means that mom is more likely to purchase things that will improve her whole family's quality of life, things like fresh food and books rather than leisure items like recreational vehicles and sporting events. So by reinvesting in their households more than spending outside of it, women are creating stronger families, which can create stronger economies. Now we can look at a lot of other numbers, but I present these statistics to make the point that the environment for women to contribute to their organizations and more broadly to the economy has changed dramatically. The opportunities are there. However, women's current placement in the economic hierarchy is not proportional to their capacity. Women are entering the workforce just as prepared for success as men, but something goes off track as time passes both in, the, in terms of earnings and in terms of leadership positions. Clearly, there's a disconnect between women's preparedness to enter the workforce and their experience within it. So why does this happen? Well, to be sure, there are m many, many factors at play, and I'm not going to go through all of them. For example, you know, women uh, may temporarily leave the workforce to spend more time at home and um, to have and care for children. 
This can cause them to lose some valuable on-the-job skills and erode their lifetime earning uh, potential as a result. But I think it's also fair to ask whether female employees are being as, as assertive about promotions and about pay raises, or whether their supervisors may be exhibiting some uh, unconscious bias, or as, as um, Mary mentioned earlier, um, maybe we're not as um, ready to take risks, or we are more risk averse than men. So those are some of the maybes. The alternative is to believe that women simply do not perform as, as well as their male counterparts. And I assure you that that is not the case. So let's, let's focus on behaviors. Are women hesitant to take on challenging positions? There was a, a McKinsey survey done about a year ago, and uh, they surveyed about uh, uh, women in 58 very large organizations. And they found in that survey that 59% of the women that they surveyed said they didn't aspire to get the top job. Now one reason behind, I think, the surprising response may be that women, as women, were just not drawn to challenges where we don't feel that we're prepared. Yet throughout my career, I learned that it was only when I was willing to take some risks and step outside my comfort zone that I made great strides forward and was truly rewarded. I was personally pushed way outside my comfort zone uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, at that time, the CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, Jerry Jordan, uh, came to me and said that the board of directors of the bank wanted me to interview for the COO position in the, in the Federal Reserve, um, we call that the um, first vice president. At that time, I was at a vice president's level and I had no operations experience. Taking that step meant that I would be moved ahead of many senior vice presidents at the bank at that time who had a lot of operations experience and who felt that they were in line to become the next COO. I was a vice president in charge of public affairs and um, secretary to the board. I was being asked to lead about 1,500 employees at that time and up until that point in my career I had never managed more than 15 people. So, I didn't think I was prepared. Um, I was fortunate to have a mentor who I turned to for advice, and that's Karen Horn. I mentioned she was the first female president of the Federal Reserve Bank. She was my former boss. So, I went, I called her, and I told her I was being asked to interview for the COO position. I told her that I didn't think I was qualified for the job. Her response to me was, Sandy, first get the job, and then figure out how to do it. <laughs> and despite some reservations, I did accept the job and the challenge. And I know that I'm not unusual in questioning whether, I'm whether I was qualified for the job. As I mentioned, women in particular can have the tendency to want to be well prepared for whatever may come next. Uh, the senior vice president of Google for what they call people operations, uh, Laszlo Bach, said at a conference on women in the economy sponsored by the Wall Street Journal a little over a year ago, that at Google, all employees are encouraged to nominate themselves for promotions. He said that men jump at the chance, often before they're ready, and they're often turned down. But women have to be prodded. He noted that by the time a woman at Google, Google says she's ready, she was probably ready a year earlier. So my advice to women is the same advice that Karen Horn gave me. Embrace opportunities that come your way, whether you feel prepared or not. Raise your hand for the tough assignments, get the job, and then figure out how to do it. And I know uh, that in most cases, 
uh, you will be very successful. Most successful female executives uh, that I talk to say that they are willing to take on difficult jobs and to take on areas that are broken. Uh, and that then uh, allows them to demonstrate their abilities and then um, allows them to give the opportunity, get the opportunity for more advancement. And we know that women do have what it takes to be leaders. It's true that women are good listeners, very collaborative. Uh, those are essential skills in today's workplace. But our colleagues and our direct reports agree with that assessment uh, because women tend to have much higher ratings on 360 degree feedback reviews. But the assumption that m most people make is that women are better leaders than men only in these um, soft skill areas, in the nurturing and, and uh, the relationship building and the development of others. But it turns out that that's not the case. We are very good at those skills, and we have them. But a well-publicized study by a, a consulting firm, Zenger Folkman, found that women score higher than men in 12 of 16 competencies that leaders exemplify. And those traits include behaviors such as taking initiative, problem solving, driving for results. Those aren't the stereotypical characteristics that one might use to describe a woman. And in addition to being a, effective business leaders, there's also a lot of research that supports that women are also very successful business owners. I have long advocated that education and innovation are what drives economic growth in communities, in regions, in countries. But an innovation is also a very critical ingredient in the success of any business. And according to a report by the Global Entre Entrepreneurship Monitor, more women entrepreneurs than men introduce innovation to their businesses. And that's, that is very good news. Unfortunately, the same report found that fewer women than men take the risks of starting their own businesses because they don't believe they're capable of succeeding. I think this lack of confidence is holding back individuals and our economy. And I doubt that anyone in this room would tell me that women do not make great leaders or great business owners. So I think it's time for us to start encouraging each other to take some risks and to reap the rewards, uh, even greater rewards, that uh, those risks, that risk taking can, can bring us. Now, um, I, I, to bring out this point, uh, so I mentioned that there, there are behaviors. The ones that I've just been talking about are personal behaviors, maybe not risk taking, not being confident that we can do more. But there, I also said that there may also be some subconscious biases that are going on in an organization that hold women back. And I had the opportunity just a few months ago to hear um, the dean of the Harvard Business School, Nitin Noria, uh, speak about this issue at a recent, uh, leader, uh, recent meeting of business leaders. And I found his observation that he shared very fascinating. He, he told the audience that day that Harvard admitted its first woman to the Harvard MBA program in 1963. Today, women make up 41% of the Harvard Business School. Um, so that's a, a great accomplishment. But it's going to be another one of those good news, bad news stories. So he was very interested and very pleased that Harvard Business School was um, making a lot of progress and bringing bringing women into the program. But he noticed that women were not receiving the recognition, the grades, and the honors at the same proportion that they were being represented in the class. So he, he, so he started to talk to some of the administrators about this issue. And one, clearly, uh, one of the first assumptions made was well, maybe we aren't bringing in women 
that have the same, um, the same uh, background, that, that, that we're bringing in women uh, in order to pick up our numbers that aren't as prepared. Well, they went back and looked at the schools that the women graduated from, the grades that they achieved at those schools, their GMAT scores, that wasn't the case. They were equal. They had the same backgrounds as the men. So, the, um, so they said, well, we need to, to look at this further. What they found uh, was that in the Harvard MBA programs, 50%, they still do the case study pro, um, uh, method, 50% of the grade in every class is based on class participation. Well, when, so they started to look at, well, uh, you know, let's look at this class participation. There are two factors involved. One is the individual, uh, the, the female students, and how they, how they choose to be recognized in class, and also the, um, the way that they measured class participation was that the professor following the, his class would go back to his office and by memory try to remember who he called on and what the person said in class and that's how the, the, the class participation grade was established. Well, as they looked into this further, they realized that again there are some differences in the way men and women behave in, in a setting like a setting like this. Um, it, it turns out that you know, fem most females, when they want to be recognized, raise their hand like this. Whereas many of the men in the class, when they wanted to re be recognized, would do this. <laughs> and I'm exaggerating. But they were more aggressive. And it turns out that it wasn't just the female students that were a little more careful and, and reserved in the way they uh, chose to be called on. It turned out that the foreign students in the class also had the same issues. They were a little more reserved. So. Uh, what they decided to do was, uh, in an orientation program, help female students and foreign students uh, learn how to be recognized in a class. So that ad helped address the first issue. The second issue about how the professor was recalling who he or she called on and what contribution was made um, was also an issue. So they addressed that issue by putting a proctor in the class. And the proctor would uh, note who call, was called on and what the contribution was. Well, not surprising, two years later, the class grades became almost the same. Men and women are now performing at the same rate um, as, uh, in, as, as a result of some of these changes that were made. So at the end of the two-year experiment, the gap in academic achievement between the male and female students had vanished. Uh, and so, it, it, again, again it's, a, it's an experiment, a real-life experiment, that if you level the playing field, um, and that means, again, the women taking some of the initiative, but also the supervisors making sure that the, there, there, aren't un, there aren't some biases in the room, that women's success is every bit as certain as men. And the professional challenges that women face can be overcome. Now I also want to take a moment to, uh, to focus on another important issue, and that's the important role that education plays in all of this, in women's success. And we've just published some research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland this month that shows that students who take the most math courses, even in high school, earn higher wages and are less likely to be unemployed. And today, more women than ever are furthering their education, but the majority are choosing career fields that pay lower, lower pay, um, pay scales than those dominated by men. I, I mentioned that women are uh, entering college um, and choosing to further their education. And it's true that women now outnumber, outnumber men in college enrollment in almost every country in the world. Here in the U.S., women are receiving 58% of all undergraduate degrees. And percentages are higher in even other countries like Brazil and Sweden. But we can't overlook the fact that male college students 
outnumber women in the STEM programs, the sciences, technology, engineering, and math, which then translates into higher earning potentials after graduation. Only about 28% of well-paying sciences and en engineering jobs in this country are held by women. So uh, there's some work we can do there. Th we had done another study at the Cleveland Fed that showed that the top earning careers are the math, so engineering, but also economics and finance were very high in that, um, that rating. And I was fortunate to be able to turn my passion for economics into a 37-year career at the Federal Reserve. And perhaps we can encourage more women, young women, in our lives to consider fields like engineering, math, economics, and finance. So indeed, there are organizational changes and, and challenges that we as a society can start looking at. Um, they're not going to change overnight, but I think it's important for us to, to, to think about them. And you know those, those organizational changes and societal changes take time. That's culture change, and culture change does take time. But there are changes that we do have control over, and, and those are our own behaviors. And I believe that individual change, if we start changing some of our own behaviors, that will translate into cultural change broader in our society. You know, clearly, uh, you know, we're, we're not women. I'm talking now to the women in the audience. We're not men, and we don't need to behave like men. Um, you know, but we can redefine what su success looks like. I mean, we can take some steps, whether it's taking some ad additional risks uh, or supporting other women, those of us who have roles, leadership roles, uh, supporting other women to take on more risk, uh, being supportive and encouraging them to be more competent. And it, it is so important that women succeed, not only because we will personally benefit, but, but I think our economy and our country would benefit. So I hope we can agree today to help one another avoid some of the professional pitfalls that I talked about in my comments, uh, and that I, I hope that we can agree that we'll help one another achieve some personal success, but also, um, and as a result of that, we'll have a collective um, success. And I hope that some of the comments and some of the issues that I described today, you know, will, will help us um, think about these issues and, and, again, take some actions that we, that we do have within our control uh, to create an environment where everyone in our organization can contribute uh, to their maximum potential. And that's the goal that I've had as uh, the leader at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland and that my manage management team has. And I can tell you uh, it does produce results. So thank you very, very much for your kind attention, for the invitation to be your uh, kickoff speaker at this very, uh, very interesting and uh, productive conference. And I think we have time for a few questions. Absolutely, Mary. when the president's job came up. How, had you changed? Did everybody hear that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Did the mindset change? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the, when the president's job became available, I applied for that job. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked to get that job. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you a story, Mary, because that's an interesting, um, because uh, the, the organization had also changed their views. I mentioned that when I was asked to interview for the COO job, um, I, I interviewed, got the job, obviously. I still remember Jerry Jordan, the president of the bank, gathering all of the officers. There were about 50 officers in an auditorium to announce that I had been named the COO. There were gasps in the room. <laughs> people, you should have seen people's faces. People, and mostly women uh, officers, there were a handful of them, came up to me afterwards and said, can you do this job? So it was a, it, it, I knew I had a lot of work ahead of me, 
in order to gain their respect and their support. Then 10 years later, when the chairman of our board, in a much larger auditorium, uh, with several hundred of our employees gathered, announced that I'd been named president of the bank, the room erupted in cheers. So I think that both you know, the organization accepting uh, that someone with my background uh, could do the COO's job, I think um, I felt that I, was, that I um, was ready and wanted the CEO's job, and the org organization was also very supportive. Thank you so much. Um, looking historically at the women's movement from Rosie the Riveter in the, in the 40s to the 60s movement with Marches and Bella Abzug taking the lead, what do you see today as an inflection moment in also moving the women's um, opportunities forward? Do you see 2008 and the financial crisis playing a role in that? Or is there some other major moment that years from now we'll look back and point at as an inflection moment? It's interesting. I'm going to go back again to my mentor, Karen Horn, to answer that question. Because um, I found uh, on many occasions, for instance, she was invited to give a speech um, to a totally male audience in an organization then called the Union Club. Um, and it had no male members. And I said to her, you know, Karen, why aren't, why are you, um, why are you doing this? Why aren't you upset? And can't you show more, um, be more vocal about how this isn't fair, or this isn't uh, inappropriate? And her response to me was, Sandy, I'm going to make a difference by being successful at what I do. Look at this. They've invited a woman to speak to a totally male audience because I'm the expert, I have the expertise. So my answer to you is going to be that what's going to make a difference today is that women in key roles like Janet Yellen becoming the chair of the Federal Reserve System and being very successful at that is going to make a huge difference in how women are viewed. And we've seen that in other leadership roles. Six, you know, and, and I mean, I know it feels, you know, it, it's, it, it doesn't make sense that we, ha that we have to prove the success in doing these jobs, but I do think that these very, very competent, successful women are going to help change and shape, you know, change attitudes. And so, um, you know, I know we have to be patient, but, but we're getting more opportunities for women in these very visible uh, leadership roles and being very successful at them, that, that will make the difference and, and help move, uh, and move the so-called women's movement forward. Thank you, good morning. Can you talk a bit about, uh, you mentioned how you tried to make sure that every single person in your organization is offering something productive. How do you make sure that the good ideas get to you? How do you make sure you hear all the bad news? Can you give us some um, examples of how you really make sure that your whole team is uh, a functioning whole unit? Thank you. A couple of comments um, in response to your good question. When I took on the role of COO, um, I obviously, I mean, the, the bank was trying to make a culture change. They wanted to go from a very hierarchical, top-down management style to one that was more participative. They're thinking the board of directors um, of the bank at that time thought that by appointing someone who didn't have the experience, my predecessor made all the decisions, told people what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And that was the culture within many large organizations. And so the thinking was by bringing on someone who couldn't tell people what to do, when to do it, how to do it, I'd have to bring in the entire team, that we would become more participative. 
And in fact, um, I spent a lot of time meeting with employees and talking to employees. I mentioned, though, that I inherited a group of senior officers, senior vice presidents, who, um, who were very disappointed, obviously, that, uh, and I had to, I had to uh, win their support. So I brought in a consultant and to go and talk to each one of them, find out you know, what they liked about my leadership style, what they didn't like. And we went off-site where this uh, facilitator that we brought in, the consultant, you know, uh, brought all this information. And I still remember the flip chart. There was the things that they liked about Sandy. And then the things that they didn't like, the first thing on the list is I spent too much time listening to employees. <laughs> the second thing they didn't like is that when I asked them to do something, I expected it would get done. So I asked them, what do you mean by that, expected to get done? And they go, oh, your predecessor would ask us three times. If he asked us the third time, then we knew we needed to do it. I said, no, no, this is going to change. We're going to, when I ask you, we'll do something the first time. But this, old, this issue of listening to employees, I also told them that wasn't going to change because that's what we needed is to get more. And the people who are actually doing the work know so much more about how it can be done better uh, what new ideas uh, they could bring to the table. So creating an environment, and it took, it, it's hard to change a culture where um, you ask people who had a lot of expertise to s listen to their employees, to spend time with their employees and getting that information. So that's um, the culture that we tried to establish at the Cleveland Fed. In terms of my management team, I, um, I often, and I mentioned that women behave you know, differently. I, um, I, I early on, in some uh, opportunities before I became the COO, I remember getting an opportunity because I became part of, a, of the management team where the CEO at that time, Lee Hoskins, brought his direct reports together um, in uh, every week. And I, because I was um, secretary to the board of directors, was part of that team that he brought together. Well, after three or four weeks of meetings, he came to me and he said, Sandy, you've been coming to these meetings for three or four weeks now, but you haven't said a word yet. Why is that? He goes, if you, I'm asked you to be part of this team, and, I'm, and I expect you to contribute. So now, when I have t um, meetings with a diverse group of individuals, and I see that sometimes some of the women, or others, it's not only women, some individuals aren't contributing. I, um, in a comfortable way, not a, not a way that makes them uncomfortable, challenging, will ask if they have some ideas to contribute. Some people just aren't as assertive in, in giving you their ideas, but you can ask for their ideas. And, and I think, you know, uh, uh, Ben Bernanke is a good example of a great, of a good leader. He's a very good listener. When we, when we meet at the FOMC meeting, you know, we have two sets of policy go-rounds. I mean, go-rounds. The first is where we each um, talk about the economy and our outlook for the economy. And then the second go-around is on monetary policy. Well, Ben goes last in those go-arounds, and he listens to everyone. And he will t make it a point sometimes to, to ask people, um, you know, what their perspective is or to draw in individuals. And it, and, it, and it results in a much better decision-making process and in better, I think, results and decisions. So there's, there are ways that we can do that in our meetings, make sure that we are bringing in those individuals that tend to be a little more quiet. Well, thank you. I think you mentioned that women were, were more innovative and yet didn't start businesses. And I thought women's business formation rate was higher than men, so I was wondering if you could elaborate. No, it was just, uh, it, it was just a um, study that I, that I found um, that said that, you know, women do introduce more innovations to their businesses. And then I said the, the bad news part of it was that we weren't as risk takers in starting new businesses. Uh, you are correct, and maybe some of our panelists later who are more familiar with small businesses, because I know there are some data that show that there are more women business owners um, than, than men. And I don't know what group of uh, businesses this particular study was looking at. Um, but, 
but you, but it's just, I think the point they were trying to make is that in, innovations that are brought to businesses are more likely to happen in, in women-owned businesses. But you're right, and maybe later on there are some people that can talk about uh, women business owners and the startup numbers. Thank you again, and I, I look forward to hearing uh, President Pianalto, let's give her a hand.